Okay, so today we uh, come to look at our first uh, genuinely modern thinker, uh, Moses Mendelssohn. And Mendelssohn's main book, uh, which he called Jerusalem, is specifically about religion and politics. Uh, the subtitle of his book, Jerusalem, is called On Religious Power and Judaism. So there's uh, kind of a complicated story here about how he thinks of Judaism, what he thinks Judaism is, why he thinks the way he does, who he's arguing against, his relationship with Spinoza, his relationship with his contemporaries, both German and Jewish, um, his proposal for what the Jewish people uh, need to do to be accepted as German citizens. What they need to do has a lot uh, to do with repressing their political heritage, presenting themselves as a religion, only a religion, and a certain kind of religion, a religion that's rational, a religion that doesn't impose irrational things, beliefs, or practices on people. There's a polemic, there's an argument going on here within Judaism and between Judaism and the non-Jewish world. Um, to a certain extent, Mendelssohn is responding to Maimonides. To a large extent, he's responding to Spinoza. Uh, Mendelssohn is thinking about the history of the Jews and their experience in Europe. So a lot of important things are coming together in Mendelssohn's thought. Um, so first, I'll say a few words about Mendelssohn himself, and uh, sort of describe his, his project, his activity here. Mendelssohn is, um, his dates are He was uh, born and raised in a little town in east, uh, the eastern part of Germany called Dessau. The, uh, the city of Dessau has uh, gotten very proud of Mendelssohn lately. Uh, and they now have uh, every year the Moses Mendelssohn Prize. And they give this honor to uh, an academic who studies German Judaica. And uh, it uh, pleased me very much to learn that my colleague, uh, former chancellor and a uh, very distinguished historian of 19th century Jewish thought and life in German-speaking Central Europe, Ismar Schorsch. He was born in Hanover, fled the Nazis as a as a child of his parents. He was invited uh, a couple of months ago to Dessau to win the Moses Mendelssohn Prize. So, have you, have you met the uh, Ismar Shorsh? No, I've heard about him. Yeah, yeah. wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, Great is, can you write uh, the name of uh, that? Of Mendelssohn? No, no, of uh, the uh, historian. Uh, Ismar recently wrote a book about Leopold Suns, great 19th century historian, uh, Jewish historian who really founded what today we call Mata uh, Yadu, Jewish studies, what we're doing here, academic study of Judaism. And, uh, 
It's a very good book uh, by a very good historian. Anyway, Moses Mendelssohn, uh, he uh, came from Dessau as a young man and was uh, allowed to enter Berlin. Uh, Berlin had very strict limits on its Jewish population. So you had to have special permission to come. Uh, and Mendelssohn uh, was sort of taken in by uh, Jews who were already there, who recognized his talent. He taught himself European languages, German, French, he could read English, as I recall. Um, of course, he knew Hebrew uh, very well. And uh, he came to Berlin at a, a good time, because even though the Jews were not citizens and were there on a tolerated basis, there was uh, an atmosphere where at least some intellectuals were open to the idea that Jews should be emancipated. They should be allowed to become German citizens. Uh, Mendelssohn sensed that there were changes, the possibility for changes in the air. Uh, he wrote in German. He was celebrated among German intellectuals. He was called the German Socrates. One of his books, which has nothing to do with Judaism, is called Phaedon. It's uh, kind of a modern adaptation of Plato's philosophical dialogue, the Phaedo. It's about uh, the immortality of the soul. And uh, Mendelssohn was sort of recognized as a phenomenon, uh, as this Jew who wrote perfect German and who was a philosopher. Uh, he, was, uh, he was celebrated by liberal-minded people, and in fact, he won a contest for the best philosophical essay. Uh, and he beat out, he, he won over a minor German thinker you might have heard of, named uh, Immanuel Kant. Because he, he, he won the essay contest Early before Kant was Kant. I mean, Kant hadn't come into his, his own yet as a world-shaking uh, philosopher. But uh, Mendelssohn tried in public to avoid Jewish um, claims to talking about the Jews to other Germans. Uh, he was working in the Jewish community uh, very hard uh, to help educate other Jews. The basic idea among this kind of upper crust, upper class of Jewish writers and intellectuals and wealthy merchants in Berlin, the capital of Prussia, was that for the Jews to be accepted, they had to become acculturated. That is, they had to learn not just German language, they had to learn to think of themselves as Europeans, not exiled Asiatics who lived in Europe. They had to think of themselves as Europeans, they had to acquire uh, the ability to participate in European culture, the elite culture in Germany was not German culture, it was French culture. Uh, so, Mendelssohn um, was very influential in the Jewish world in helping to found uh, something that's called Hebrew it's called the Haskalah. So what is Haskalah? Those of you who've heard this term before. Jewish enlightenment. Exactly. So we're in this 
period sometimes called the Age of Reason, sometimes called the Enlightenment. In German it's called the Aufklärung. And uh, Kant has a famous essay, Was ist Aufklärung? What is Enlightenment? Kant says we do not live in an enlightened age. Let's not pat ourselves in the back too much. We live in an age capable of enlightenment. Enlightenment is a possibility, it's a challenge, it's not a guarantee or a given. So Mendelssohn and his circle want to move a kind of Jewish version inspired by the general version of an enlightenment, the Berlin Haskalah. So what does this involve? Uh, first of all, it involves uh, educating Jews in modern European culture and language. So one of Mendelssohn and his circle's big projects is the translation of the Bible into German uh, for Jews. So uh, there is a German translation of the Bible, Luther's, but it's not user-friendly if you're a Jewish. Uh, so what you need is a way to um, take the Hebrew of the Bible and to use it to teach German language. And the way Moses Mendelssohn and his colleagues do this is to write um, a commentary on the text. The commentary is called the Bi'ur, the elucidation. And it's in Hebrew letters, but it's in the German language. Um, so it's an aid to learning German, but uh, it's something more than that. If you try to read the Bi'ur, Try to read it, uh, but it, it, it's it's sort of a uh, a way of educating the Jewish reader to behave more like a contemporary, sophisticated European. That is, the viewer has kind of a consistently moral message of what the text means. A lot of what it does is simply take prior Jewish commentary, medieval commentary like Rashi and others, and sort of puts it into German, and Jews would be familiar with that, but it often preaches enlightenment moralistic or ethical lessons, uh, what it is to be a decent, honest, you know, virtuous, contemporary person. So, okay. Um, as Mendelssohn came to, uh, uh, another thing I, I should just mention about the Enlightenment is um, it is also the beginning uh, of the concerted, the focused attempt to take Hebrew, the language of prayer, of rabbinic scholarship, and turn it into a language of belet. You know, to take it and to pr start to produce a modern literature in it. Uh, fiction, poetry, song. So that whole project of kind of developing a Hebraic culture along European lines, that goes back to the 18th century and to Berlin and this Jewish Haskalah. Again, the idea is that in order for Jews to find greater acceptance among Germans, they have to shed their foreignness. They have to become more like the Germans. And we'll see how this plays out in Mendelssohn's, uh, Mendelssohn's thought about Judaism and politics. Um, Mendelssohn uh, as I said, uh, as he became more famous, people began to challenge him uh, about why he remains Jewish. The uh, 
enlighteners were not necessarily very enlightened about Judaism. And they saw uh, Mendelssohn as a paradox. Certainly someone who wants to be part of the enlightenment movement of the modern world would want to join a more rational, moral, uh, spiritual religion. Uh, obviously, uh, Lutheran or Reformed Protestantism. Why isn't Mendelssohn doing that? So people began to challenge him. A Swiss theologian named Lavater, an anonymous author whom we now know to be a man named Kranz, another author named Merschel, they all were writing kind of open letters uh, over more than a decade to challenge Mendelssohn to defend his decision to remain a Jew, because that was unbelievable to them. So Mendelssohn, not willingly, uh, had to make an argument for why he's Jewish, what Judaism is, why Jews should remain Jewish, how Judaism can be compatible with citizenship in a modern state. Uh, all of these things were forced on him. And uh, his main book about uh, his sort of theory of Judaism, if you will, Jerusalem, comes out of those controversies. So on one hand, it's a, it's a German book that is an answer to German critics that lays out a theory of religion, a theory of Judaism, a theory of politics, a theory of Jewish law, and it puts all of this together into a polemic of how Judaism is compatible with uh, German citizenship that were offered. On the other hand, it's also written for Jews, and it tries to convince Jews of a certain way of seeing their own tradition that would help them in the process of uh, Haskalah and of becoming German. So, have people basically heard this story before from your history courses? I mean, is this Okay. Um, so Mendelssohn um, actually has a positive attitude towards Spinoza. And Spinoza becomes a, an important figure in this discussion. Some of the Germans who criticized Judaism and who criticized Mendelssohn for remaining a Jew use Spinoza as the basis for their criticism. And they say, look, we know what Judaism is. Judaism is an ecclesiastical law, that is, it's a religious law that was the law of an ancient state that state is gone, and yet the Jews, for some bizarre reasons, continue to live according to that law, as if that made any sense. Jews don't recognize that a more universal, a more spiritual, a more ethical law has taken the place of their ceremonial law. That's the law of Christ. Um, I mean, Spinoza says as much. So Spinoza helps to shape the outlook of uh, Germans, including people like uh, Kant, uh, very much approved of Mendelssohn's work, by the way. Um, so uh, Mendelssohn had every right to uh, despise Spinoza for pushing these you know, rather negative views of Judaism as an anachronism, as something that's been superseded, as merely a political way of life. But uh, I think it's to Mendelssohn's credit that he actually found much of value in Spinoza. And in some ways, he's a complete opposite of Spinoza. For Spinoza, Judaism is primarily a politics. For Mendelssohn, Judaism is an anti-politics. Judaism needs to, to get rid of, to jettison, to reject anything that's left 
of its one-time political heritage and become even truer to itself by overcoming its political tendencies. That's Mendelssohn's view. Uh, but still he finds uh, things of, uh, of value. And what he, uh, I'd say what he agrees with uh, Spinoza in is that for both Spinoza and Mendelssohn, Judaism is primarily a matter of law that has been revealed by God. For Spinoza, that law comes to an end when the ancient Israelite state comes to an end. For Mendelssohn, it's more complicated than that. For Mendelssohn, the ceremonial law, keeping the Sabbath, keeping kosher, things like that, that still endures until God himself abrogates it, brings it to an end. But for Mendelssohn, also the political dimension of Judaism, he, he agrees with Spinoza, that has properly come to an end, and yet something remains after that. So there's a kind of agreement about the nature of Judaism is revealed law, and when the political aspects of this have come to an end and what that means. Now, what does it mean to say that for Mendelssohn, or, and for Spinoza, Judaism is to be thought of primarily as revealed law. For Spinoza, uh, you remember from yesterday, the prophets are not philosophers. The prophets are not scientists. Maimonides believes that philosophers are prophets scientists, they're, I'm sorry, the prophets are philosophers or scientists, they're people who've reached the epitome, the peak of intellectual perfection. Spinoza says that's nonsense. They, the prophets are religious figures, they're distinguished by their imagination, not by their intellect. And for Spinoza, imagination is a dirty word. Spinoza, to be distinguished by your imagination means you're not thinking clearly. You don't understand reality. Your mind does not form what he and Descartes call clear and distinct ideas. You're coloring the clear and distinct idea of reality that you should be able to achieve with another dirty word for Spinoza, emotions. That is, hope, fear, it's clouding everything. It's making everything about you and your life, and your destiny, your hopes, your fears, your passions, your loves, your hates. That's all in the way of a clear view of reality. So for Maimonides, that's exactly what the prophet achieves, real understanding of the world, physically and metaphysically. For Spinoza, that's nothing what the prophet achieves. They're simply political leaders who know how to use statecraft and law to get people to obey. They're able imaginatively to make the leap from law to politics to rule. For Spinoza, all truth is available through philosophy and through physics, through science. Religion has nothing to do with truth. Religion has to do with good behavior. Religion has to do with ethics. The message of scripture has nothing to do with understanding the world, it has to do with how people should behave in society. Period, full stop. So, for Mendelssohn, there's a kind of agreement with Spinoza. To say that Judaism is primarily revealed law means Judaism does not teach truths about the world. Judaism, as Mendelssohn puts it, has no beliefs. Judaism does not require Jews to believe anything. What Judaism has by way of belief is what you get from what he calls the natural light of reason. The truths of mathematics are revealed by the natural light of reason. 
Um, we don't look to the Torah to tell us 2 plus 2 equals 4. Reason imposes beliefs on us out of its own grasp of the world. So what's the Torah about? As a revealed law, it's about how you should behave. There's an agreement with Spinoza there. For Spinoza, you shouldn't behave that way any longer because the law has come to an end. For Mendelssohn, the law hasn't come to an end except its political parts. So you should behave how the Torah tells you to behave. But there's this, you see the kind of agreement with Spinoza that basically the Bible has a moral core to it and that's what endures. Um, from Mendelssohn's point of view, there are no obligatory beliefs in Judaism. There's only the natural light of reason. That's what Jews should believe. Uh, well, the Torah is not just law. The Torah tells us a lot of stories. It gives us historical uh, stories, like the story, the story about um, well, becomes Skinnerian dogs here. When the text message goes off, it, oh, that's mine, where's my phone? That's in my bag in the other room. <laughs> uh, so, what do you do with the historical narratives of the, of the Bible? Well, Spinoza says, well, yeah, I, I'm sorry, uh, Mendelssohn believes they, they really happen. Uh, you know, there were elders, there was Samuel, that story is, is true in a sense. So we have to believe it. Um, you don't have to believe it, but it's there for our edification. That is, there's no harm in believing it. It's not like a dogma of Judaism that you have to believe all of these things happen, but they did happen. They're historical contingencies. They can't be revealed by natural reason. Natural reason deals with necessary truths, uh, with the truths of, uh, of reason logical truth, mathematical truth. For Mendelssohn, physics is a sort of natural uh, reason truth. So um, Mendelssohn wants to make a very radical claim that there are no obligatory beliefs in Judaism. He says Jews in the Middle Ages did try to, they contended, they argued that Judaism had uh, dogmas, there were doctrines, there were beliefs that you had to believe. And if you didn't believe them, you did not have a portion of the world to come. You wouldn't be saved, to use Protestant and Christian language. Mendelssohn thinks that's insane. He thinks that's just completely wrong. The previous thinker who we looked at two days ago, who very much tied Judaism up with obligatory beliefs, is Maimonides. Maimonides was the first Jewish thinker to be um, very dedicated to the proposition that in order to be a Jew, you had to believe 13, uh, 13 propositions. There are 13 obligatory beliefs, and these beliefs have the status of mitzvot, of commandments. So, for example, Jews um, sometimes number the Ten Commandments as beginning with Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am the Lord your God. They sometimes treat that not just as an introduction, as a prologue to what follows, but as a commandment in and of itself. That is the Mitziut Hashem, the existence of God as a first cause. That's a belief. Maimonides started that. He said, if you don't believe that there is a first cause, and the first cause is, is God, as we understand God from Scripture, um, you're a bad Jew. You may not be a Jew at all. A Jew has to believe that. A later thinker, a uh, century after Maimonides, Chazdai Kreska, says nonsense. He says that can't be a, that can't be a belief. Uh, Kreska has several arguments for why it can't be a belief, but 
This is to say the status of belief in Judaism is very controversial. Um, it's an interesting ongoing problem. Uh, a lot of Jews today, I think, believe that Judaism has no beliefs. So, what distinguishes a good religious Jew from a less good religious Jew has to do with the commitment to practice, commitment to the halakha, the law, way of life, and so on. And this whole belief business, Judaism leaves you totally free to believe or not to believe, doubt is okay, skepticism is okay, that's all okay. That's all Mendelssohn. <laughs> I mean, Mendelssohn is, is kind of the modern godfather of that view. But he's not coming from, you know, nowhere. Uh, before Maimonides, there, were, there was no real attempt to say, you have to believe X, Y, and Z. The most that the Mishnah and the Talmud give us is there are things that you shouldn't believe. But it doesn't tell us that you should believe things. It just tells us that there are some things that you should not believe. Um, Maimonides is the first one to try to argue that Judaism is constituted by correct belief. Mendelssohn wants to go back, in a sense, to the pre-Maimonides situation. So for him to say that the Torah is primarily revealed law is to reject possibly irrational dogmas. And one of his arguments against becoming Christian is that he thinks that Christianity is less rational than Judaism. Judaism has no beliefs other than what appears to you through the natural light of reason. Therefore, it doesn't ask you to believe on faith that three and one are the same thing, a Trinitarian conception of monotheism, for example. So it's part of an argument that Judaism is very well adapted to being a, a modern faith in a modern European world, because you don't have to believe anything that's ancient or medieval or doesn't somehow fit in with the intellectual climate of an enlightened age, of an age capable of enlightenment. And he thinks that this is the virtue of Judaism, this is part of its uh, superiority. He also famously say, says that the people who want him to convert to Christianity essentially want him, as Spinoza did, to undermine Judaism. And Christians themselves recognize Judaism as the foundation. He says it's the foundation, the basement of the house on which Christianity is built. If you destroy the foundation, the upper stories collapse. That wouldn't be good for anybody. So, okay. Um, So, okay, to um, kind of get into the, the heart of this, um, in 1781, a German Lutheran government official by the name of Christian Wilhelm on Dome, writes a little book in which he argues that the society should be more tolerant of Jews. Indeed, if the society began to emancipate the Jews and gave them more rights, and gave them more political participation and stability, the Jews themselves would change and become more like us. The Germans would be good for everybody. The pamphlet was called On the Civic Improvement of the Jews. Moses Mendelssohn did not like the title. He didn't think the Jews needed to be improved. 
thinks the Jews need to be accepted. So he disputed with Fandom about the, 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 the title of it. But uh, Fandom made an interesting point that really goes to the heart of the matter in terms of the self-understanding of Jews and the political dimension. Dom argues that as the Jews are accepted more into society and given rights, they should be allowed to retain the right of cherem, of excommunication. That is, their religious community should have some power left in it, as has been the case through the Middle Ages, where in pre-modern times, Jews lived in communities where they could fine their members, they could imprison them in some places, they could whip them if they misbehaved, they could expel them, and in Spain, they could even execute them. Um, this was, you know, a medieval community that was a bit like a state within a state. For people like Moses Mendelssohn, uh, that is fundamentally wrong. There's something absolutely horrifying about that. That is a political dimension of Judaism that has to be dismantled. There's no justification for that. And he thinks that Dome is, uh, is completely wrong, dead wrong, absolutely wrong, for thinking that Jews should continue to live in these kind of segregated communities where they keep up a kind of uh, residue of political power that comes from uh, the Gentiles saying, okay, govern yourselves, just give us you know, so much money every year and we'll leave you alone until we decide to kick you out. Mendelssohn doesn't want any of that. So what he wants is uh, an argument for a Judaism that no longer is segregated, that no longer lives in an exclusive community, and that no longer has any political power. It's a post-political Judaism. I would say as he does it, an anti-political Judaism. It's a Judaism that's simply a religion, and a very peculiar kind of religion, a religion that has no beliefs whatsoever, but a religion in which people practice laws that have to do with ritual. That's what, uh, that's where, where his argument's going to be pointed. Um, so, I think one of the readings you have here, uh, and this was, um, this was a, um, A reading that we could, uh, my colleague found in a Russian translation. Uh, so I assume you have that, the Russian version of this. It should be in the Moses Mendelssohn readings number 15. Do you have it? No, yes. 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 Okay, good. So in the English, it's called On the Curtailment of Jewish Juridical Autonomy. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Um, so this is uh, his response to Dome, and Dome's belief that Jews should retain a kind of quasi uh, imperium in imperio state within a state status within German society. In other words, that Jews should have rights as a corporate body rather than as individuals. Um, so he says, uh, I can scarcely conceive how a writer of Herr Dohm's great judgment could say as all other religious societies have a right of expelling members, either for a limited time or forever, the Jewish should have it too. And in case of resistance of the rabbi's sentence, be supported by the civil authorities. So it's not just that the uh, 
Jewish kihila, the Jewish community, should be able to expel, excommunicate members. But the state should defer to that, and the state should support the harem as well. So Dome sees, you know, as a good German, kind of an entanglement of church and state. Lutheranism is the official religion of Poitzen, Prussia. The king is the head of the, the Lutheran church, the Kaiser. All societies have a right of expelling members. Religious ones only have not. For it runs diametrically contrary to their principle and object, which is joint edification and participating in the outpouring of the heart, by which we evince our thankfulness to God for the many bounties he bestows on us and our filial trust in his sovereign goodness and mercy. Then with what conscience can we deny entrance to dissenters, separatists, misbelievers, or sectarians and deprive them for the benefit, that uh, might be in English, Let's unpack this. Uh, Mendelssohn. Can you is please repeat what was the name of the article? On the curtailment of Jewish <laughs> juridical autonomy. It's in the Mendelssohn section. It's selection kidnapped. <laughs> I don't know what it is in Russian. I brought it along and I left it in my hotel room. Not I, I think that in Russian is the problem is there's there's a whole group of selections from Mendelssohn and I didn't want you to read every one just two of them so this is this is his preface to Manasseh ben Israel's Vindicti Yudei Lorum we found it. Okay, can you announce what it is in Russian so that others can look? Okay. Okay. Um, basically, what Mendelssohn is going to argue for right here, and then a couple of years later in Jerusalem, is a theory of the relationship between politics and religion. He wants to say that there's a fundamental division of labor in what the state does and what a church or a synagogue does. Both of these are forms of social organization, but they are not uh, comparable. The state has as its mission creating uh, a secure way of life for its people, protecting them, armies, police. Um, so he is basically advocating the secular conception of the state. He is. He's advocating uh, not a total separation of religion and state, mm -hmm. but fundamentally a secular conception of the state in which the religion helps the state. Mm -hmm. The state helps religion to the extent that it leaves it alone. But uh, they have just different functions and uh, different uh, fields of, uh, I don't know. Different, different fields of activity. Of activity. They need each other, but they're fundamentally on principle different. They're called into being for different purposes. And therefore, when one tries to take over the purposes of the other, that's bad. It, 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 it should not do that. It goes against its own calling, its own purpose, its own mission. That's the view. So Mendelssohn has read John Hobbes. Uh, he's read Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. He hasn't read Thomas Locke and John Hobbes. He's read <laughs> Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Um, and maybe you have too. 
Uh, and he, he's trying to make a, a kind of a political theory that goes down the middle between Hobbes on one side and Locke on the other. He starts out uh, the main book, Jerusalem, a section you didn't read, uh, by saying uh, both Hobbes and Locke are wrong. For Hobbes, the state is so powerful that everything is underneath it, and the state controls religion. Uh, and everyone serves the state, not out of love, but out of fear for what the Leviathan can do to them. That's going too far in an absolutely secular kind of direction, where there's nothing left of religion but just a sort of loyalty to the state. On the other hand, he says that Locke goes too far toward the church. I think this is a, not a very good reading of uh, Locke, but that's beside the point. What he says is, for Locke, um, religion becomes very, very uh, uh, powerful uh, because people, uh, Locke is a Protestant, and uh, how, does he, how does he put it? He says, um, for Locke, the state is so minimal. The purpose of the state, for Hobbes, the state is all controlling, all consuming. For Locke, the state is very thin. Uh, people mostly remain free individuals, and they give up some of their freedom in the social contract just to get some order. But a lot of what people do to lead good lives, to pursue happiness, is very private has nothing to do with the state. The state is a kind of night watchman who just keeps guard from a distance to make sure that people's property remains their own. For Mendelssohn, that's not enough. And what that means is that too much of what it takes to lead a good human life remains in the hands of the church. So the church can become too powerful. As I say, I don't think that's what Locke is saying, but that's how he reads it. He positions his political theory between Hobbes and Locke. So what he sees is the purpose of the state is fundamentally secular. It's protection, it's law, it's rights, it's order. But he's very German enlightenment about this, uh, unlike the British tradition. He says that the purpose of the state is also to help people be happy to pursue uh, eudaimonia, to pursue the flourishing human life, to pursue their zeitigkeit, their felicity, their happiness. And how does the state do that? The state does that directly through education. Mendelssohn is a big believer, like other German Enlightenment figures, in this concept, which was a Protestant concept that became more secularized, and this is the idea of Bildung. Bildung means um, self-development, education that uh, enhances one's character, that develops one's virtues, uh, and therefore makes one capable of blessedness, of happiness, of flourishing, of ethical life, of artistic creativity, of converting all of one's potential as a human being into uh, actuality. So in the Enlightenment period, there's a tremendous emphasis on this idea of self-improvement, of becoming gebildet, educated. Uh, it's not just educated, it's education in a very sort of high sense, education toward happiness. Mendelssohn believes this is the responsibility of the state. The state has to institute universal education for everybody, up to the highest level. We all have a right to that. And when the state does this, human beings will serve the state, not out of fear, as in Hobbes, uh, but out of tremendous love and loyalty because the state has made them fully human. Now, that's how the state does it directly, through education. But the state does it indirectly 
through letting religion flourish and its religion's province, its religion's domain, uh, to bring human beings toward their ultimate happiness, toward spiritual fulfillment. The state governs best when it governs through education. That is, if people know that it's wrong to commit a crime because they're moral people, then the state doesn't have to walk around with a, a club hanging over people's heads all the time. Um, religion has no club. Religion should have no club. If the state's interest is as much education as possible, so it uses as little force as possible, even though at the end of the day it has to use force sometimes, religion only has persuasion. Religion only has um, reason and ethics on its side. It is no part of religion's purpose to compel people. Kfiat datit, as they say in Hebrew, religious coercion, religious compulsion. It's no part of religion's purpose to force people to believe in God, to force people to follow Jewish law, in this case, heresy trials, witch hunts, excommunications, all of that belongs to a very dark age that uh, desecrates and disgraces religion. The essence of religion, its real purpose in the world, is persuading people through reason and example, teaching um, and training to come to uh, uh, their, their blessedness, their spiritual fulfillment. How does it correspond to the words of the Torah itself? Okay, we're getting there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's the question. If you, look at, if you look at this, if you read Jerusalem, you say, wow, this is a pretty good um, 18th century adaptation of Locke to German circumstances. It involves some really Protestant Christian distinctions like, which you also find in Spinoza, like you have ritual law and you have moral law. And ritual law, that's over. But moral law, that continues on. And Spinoza does that. That's basically St. Paul. Mendelssohn does that too. That's basically St. Paul and Spinoza to a certain extent. Uh, so what's Jewish about it? I mean, how do you square this 18th century Enlightenment political theory about religion, a word which doesn't exist in Hebrew until modern Hebrew, and uh, uh, you know, this is much more uh, broad conception. That's what he's going to argue for in Jerusalem. Uh, we, we're not seeing that yet in this, in this piece, but that's part of the argument of the Jerusalem book of how you deal with the political heritage of Judaism where there is coercion. It's also the point at which Mendelssohn is most vulnerable. That is, if Mendelssohn's basic argument is the political part, the part of Jewish law that deals with the Constitution, with civic, with civil and criminal law, all that stuff, that's over, that's gone. It doesn't exist. It's just ethics now. It's just spiritual blessedness. If that's the version that he's pushing, then his Christian critics like Kranz and Merschel jump on this and say, wait a minute, what you're describing is Christianity. What is Judaism other than any, what they call an ecclesiastical law? That's also a term in the conflict with the faculties. He said, you're not only not reading your own Torah, which prescribes the death penalty for all kinds of things, uh, but you're also essentially making a case for this universal moralistic Christianity, which you are perversely refusing to accept. What's left of Judaism other than what you're saying Judaism Dafka is not? That's a, that's a very strong argument. So Mendelssohn's got to come back uh, on that. So I, I hope you can see from now, and I'll, I'll explain how that's going to work, but I hope you can see from this that this question of religion and politics 
for a modern thinker like Mendelssohn, it's not just an interesting subtopic. It really goes to the very heart of what Judaism is for this modern thinker, of how we should think of Judaism in the modern world, uh, of the political purposes to which these arguments are put in a non-Jewish society. It's a really very central question. That's what I want you to think about in your, uh, in your final exam. So Mendelssohn would be a good thinker to write about. Um, OK. Uh, so just take uh, one more look here uh, at this particular piece. I'm going to go to the next page. Um, well, okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to the very end of uh, of the selection. He says. Um, I have that confidence, it's the last paragraph of the, uh, of the reading, I have that confidence in the more enlightened amongst the rabbis and elders of my nation, that they will be glad to relinquish so pernicious, so, so terrible a prerogative, the practice of excommunicating people, that they will cheerfully do away with all church and synagogue discipline and let their flock enjoy at their hands even that kindness and forbearance which they themselves have been so long panting for. He's basically telling us at the end here, yes, the Jews in their holdover medieval communities still have the right of excommunication. There's still this political dimension of Judaism. But the most enlightened of us want to give it up. He believes that the best of the rabbis will want to give it up. It's not that it's not real, that it's not a part of historic Judaism. It's that there's, there's something fundamentally perverse about it. It's not justified. There's no longer a reason for it. And it simply needs to be dropped from what Judaism uh, should be in the modern world, and what Judaism most essentially is. Uh, that's a weak argument. I mean, that's a very weak argument. If this right of excommunication, if these political practices like the, the criminal sanctions in the historic Jewish community are an integral part of Judaism, you don't just compromise on them in order to be members of a modern society. You have to say, no, I'm sorry. I'd rather stay in the ghetto. This is, this is my religion. Until the Messiah comes, uh, we're not going to change. So Mendelssohn really doesn't have much of an argument here. And people criticized him very much. And that's why he comes to write Jerusalem, which comes out in 1783. So let's go on to that reading. And this is the one in English. The title they give to it is called Judaism as Revealed Legislation. It's, uh, in my English, it's uh, number 20. I think the... Numbers are the same. Yeah, okay, good. So, on number 20, Judaism as Revealed Legislation. The uh, book... Uh, Jerusalem is translated into English back in 1983 by a good friend of mine who uh, looks a bit like me, and his name is also Alan. And the two of us were one day in Israel visiting a mutual friend of ours. Zikron Yaakov and his little ten-year-old son opened the door and he shouted out, <laughs> they look like each other. <laughs> so I told my wife, P 
people think Alan Arkush and I look alike, and she saw a photo of Alan Arkush. But a few years ago, we were each teaching uh, together in a summer program at Princeton University. And uh, I was going to have a drink with, with Alan at the end of the day. My wife was there, so she and I were waiting down in the bar. And Alan walks in, and my wife is like, oh my god, it's true. <laughs> but he did a much better job translating Mendelssohn's German than I would have done. Um, Okay, so this, uh, it's, a, it's a long book. I mean, it's a couple of hundred pages, and we just have a little slice of it here, but it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a selection that unpacks uh, a lot of his view. Um, so he says um, at the um, bottom of the second column, at least uh, as I have it paginated, I believe that Judaism knows of no revealed religion in the sense in which Christians understand the term. The Israelites possessed a divine legislation, laws, commandments, ordinances, rules of life, instruction in the will of God as to how they should conduct themselves in order to attain temporal and eternal felicity, happiness. Propositions and prescriptions of this kind were revealed to them by Moses in a miraculous and supernatural manner. But no doctrinal opinions, no saving truths, no universal propositions of reasoning. These the Eternal reveals to us and to all other men at all times through nature and thing, but never through word and script. Okay, well, I've, I've told you about this view of Mendelssohn's before, but part of the reason he holds this view is that if Judaism really had revealed beliefs, which people have to believe in order to achieve salvation, blessedness, happiness, felicity, it would be unfair of God. God gave the Torah to a small percentage of the human race. How could the vast majority of humanity come to a true life, to a fulfilled, flourishing life, if it had to only work with... If it had only to work with the Torah? Then that becomes a big problem for, for Christians, you know, the... the Christian uh, uh, teaching uh, in the, among the uh, church fathers is extra ecclesia of salus non est, or uh, nulla salus. Outside of the church, there is no salvation. So what do you do with Socrates? You know, what do you do with Plato? Well, they're in purgatory. They're not in hell, but they can't get to heaven. So, you know, Virgil can walk Dante around, but he's not ultimately going anywhere. So. It's, it's a moral problem for someone like Mendelssohn. He can't accept the idea that God is not good to all. It's a very universal view that he has. Does this view have a basis in Jewish tradition? Yes, it does have a basis in Jewish tradition. The Mishnah and the Talmud in the Tractate Sanhedrin says, Chassidei umot ha'olam the righteous of the nations of the world have a portion in the world to come. And righteousness is defined not in terms of belief in X, Y, or Z, but in terms of behavior. So there's a universalistic strain in Judaism. I won't say it's the only strain. There's certainly some ferociously particularist strains in Judaism. But Mendelssohn has something to stand on here. Um, so he, he lays out for us in the, in the other portions his kind of doctrine of what, what the truths of Judaism are and how they lead to um, how they lead to um, happiness, 
for human beings. What he doesn't give us in this uh, selection, which I have to kind of talk you through, uh, is how he reconciles the endurance of political forms of Judaism, of sanctions, of law, with his ideal understanding of religion. So here's how it works. And there's this Spinoza element here. He says that Judaism, as it's given to us in the Bible, uh, was unique. That is, when God gives the Torah, there's no distinction between ceremonial law, rituals like sacrifice, and then later rituals that Judaism develops, putting on tefillin, having prayers, you know, all the Jewish practices that make Judaism distinctive. Yeah, uh, that kind of thing. All of this was a unique whole. It was holistic. At a certain point in ancient Jewish history, this whole was broken. The political part, bless you, political part uh, split off from the purely religious part, we might say. Spinoza says, you know, that happens when the state falls, and he will have Judaism in its ritual dimension fall as well. Mendelssohn antedates it. Mendelssohn puts it to the episode that we read in 1 Samuel, chapter 8. As soon as a kingship is set up, the civil side of Judaism has its own autonomy, has its own integrity. It now becomes the business of a Jewish state to enforce criminal law, to enforce civil law. Under Moses, under God, that was a unique whole. You can't really use the word to describe it. He uses the word theocracy, but he doesn't like the word theocracy. By the way, do you know where the word theocracy comes from? From Greek. Yeah, it's Greek. Theokratia, but uh, ruled by God. But it was made up. It's a made up word. And the man who made it up is Josephus Flavius, the Jewish general. And Josephus, in his uh, Contra Appian, against Appian book, uh, Defense and Apologia for Judaism, he takes on this ancient Alexandrian anti Semite, Appian, and uh, he has to give a positive account, rather like Mendelssohn, of what Judaism really is. And he has a very Greek very political understanding of Judaism. He says that Judaism is a legislation that was given by God to Moses for a nation in order to achieve a kind of uh, uh, eudaimonia, a kind of happiness. And he says other nations are monarchies, are aristocracies, are republics. He says, if you will excuse this term, I would say, it is a theocracy. So he makes the word up and he apologizes for it. And he says, it is the direct ruler of God. He says that most intermediaries, like the priests, are delegated by God to teach the people, to do sacrifices, but the real ruler is God. When we get on Monday to Martin Buber, uh, you know, we'll see a modern uh, version of this, of this view. Uber was committed to as a, as a real thing. Okay, so uh, back to uh, back to Mendelssohn. Uh, before Samuel, if you committed a crime, you committed a crime against other human beings, but you also committed a crime against God. Uh, and when you were punished for the crime, it was essentially God punishing you uh, through, you know, the administration of God's law for your crime. After Samuel appoints 
King Saul and the political sphere of Judaism begins to come into its own, the state apparatus, so to speak, takes over that function, and it's no longer a unique, indescribable whole that we might refer to as a theocracy. It becomes more like a state with a religion next to it. So when the state is over, that whole civic, civil, criminal, constitutional part, that's over too. And Judaism becomes something more like what modern Europeans would call a religion, albeit without beliefs. That's essentially what Mendelssohn does. So he's not denying that the Torah has all of these laws which are, you know, which sanction punishment for crimes. He's saying it belongs to a stage of Judaism that was overcome even within, you know, uh, ancient Israel. And it's all the more strange that this should continue on in some sense in the modern world, like, like Dome argues that uh, it should. It's a, very, it's a radical reading of the Bible that has something to do with, uh, with Spinoza. Yeah. So how, how did he, if he said anything about, how did he read the story of the kinship of Saul? Did he see monarchy as positive or negative? Was it against God's will or that what God wanted? I don't know. Uh, to, my, I, to my knowledge, he didn't uh, explicitly pronounce okay. on that. So, do he believe then in the Messiah and would be the role of the functional Messiah? Seems to have had a traditional view of the Messiah. And he does seem to think that, or he doesn't seem to think, he thinks that when there's a, a restoration of the Jews in their land through God's action in the future, then all of this might come back together again as a unique whole. Or maybe not. That is, he's, he opens the possibility that God may suspend or abrogate or end the law. But certainly in the present, there's no basis for this. There's no relevance for it. Well, one thing that he does, I, I should say, is why, how does he answer the Christian critics who say, well, why be Jewish? Why continue on with this if you leave that part of the law aside why not take off your talus and tefillin and go have a cheeseburger? I mean, what's, what, what, what's, what's the point? So part of what Jerusalem does is he advances this whole theory of religion. And he sees, um, he makes the distinction here in what we read between word and thing. So religion has to do with words. and. He sees uh, in the absence of dogmas and binding beliefs, there are binding customs, binding practices. And he refers to this as a living script. He borrows a page from Plato. Plato has a complaint against writing. Plato thinks that when you write things down, it weakens the mind. Before the discovery of writing, people were much more intelligent from Plato's point of view. And Mendelssohn also fears when you write things down, um, they become static, they crystallize, they're baked in, they're not adaptable. He sees the tradition of the oral law, the Kavash of the Altet of the rabbis, with all of it you know, focused on things Jews should do. You know, I, I know some of you are taking a Talmud course here, and I saw the first page of Gemara Brachot. Uh, when you say the Shema in the, in the evening, that's a thing that you do. You know, the rabbis, they don't know, they're, they're going to discuss that. When do you do it? What, what's the time parameters for that? So his view is that the Torah gives us a living script it gives us a tradition of things to do about which we have discussions, guidelines kind of sediment in, but there's still a sort of lively discussion about how we should really practice the law as a way of life. We make it our own by doing so, and it keeps the Torah vital 
And this vitality means that the life of the Jew is influenced by the word of God day by day. It's not all, you know, here's some dogmas, believe them. It's not a catechism. Nor is it just a, uh, a recipe book where you have to follow the recipe uh, precisely. So this is his theory of religion, that the most um, effective religions that really allow individuals to achieve happiness uh, are religions of action, where you are a participant in sort of the, the writing of the, of, of the script through implementing it and interpreting it. So for him, Judaism is a living tradition. It's not just a bunch of stale, inherited practices that Jews mechanically perform in a gloomy way, which is what Spinoza thinks they are, and what Kant thinks they are, and what Hegel thinks they are. So. Okay, we are uh, out of time. Um, I like I, I like Mendelssohn, and uh, I wish the selections were a little better, but my colleague back in the U.S. felt that we should go with uh, these ones that were available in Russian. But I think it's enough to sort of give you a you know, feeling for, for this thinker. Okay.